Atua. Welcome everybody to the Napier People and Places Committee for Thursday the 4th of November. Could you please stand for our opening karakia? Thank you. Just a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on the Council's Facebook page. We have apologies from Councillors Brown and Councillors Crown and Councillor Tapine is joining has joined us on Zoom. So could I have a mover and a seconder for the apologies? Uh, move Councillor Mawson, seconded Councillor McGrath. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. <coughs> Carried. Are there any conflicts of interest? <coughs> if there are none. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, yes. Thank you. Right, we now have a public forum and I'd like to invite Jock McIntosh, the CEO of the Mitre 10 Park, to come up the front and present to us. Thank you, Jock, and welcome. Actually, I just wanted to say from the outset, um, thank you for having me. I feel like um, I should have actually been doing this years ago, but um, better late than never, I guess. Um, I'd just like to give you, spend about 10 minutes giving you an, an overview of some of the stuff that we've go, got going on at Mitre 10 Park and, and some of the stuff that's in the pipeline. And look, a lot of it you'll know about, some of it might be new to you, so it'll fill in the gaps and in information you have. A brief history for a start, it has been 15 years in the making, um, I've been in the job a bit over 10 years and um, it dates back to this time here, you probably won't remember this document but where we are now evolved out of the old Nelson Park in Hastings. So Nelson Park in Hastings when it was first developed was built when the day, in the days when rugby was split between McLean Park and Nelson Park so we had a 6,000 seat grandstand there. And it had really uh, outlived its usefulness, although that sounds a bit crude. It was um, effectively an $18 million piece of land that was primarily used by 150 members of Hastings Athletics, so it was and right in the middle of Hastings. So uh, the council correctly put to the public the option of saying, well, let's sell Nelson Park and use those facilities to build something a bit bigger and better, and went through a public referendum quite a controversial process at the time, which a lot of you probably recall, but the result of the referendum, I think, was 62% said, yes, let's do it, 38% said no. So it was a reasonable endorsement, but not an overwhelming endorsement. Uh, the, the site that was chosen for the new park was uh, the one where it is now on the expressway. It's a 30 hectare site, and um, it ignited quite a bit of controversy because a lot of people felt, and I, I get it, a lot of people felt it shouldn't be there because it was on Heratonga Plains, fertile land. Um, the decision to put it there notwithstanding that was actually because of its proximity to both towns. So um, although the distance is a bit further for Napier, it's quite an easy drive. And I think um, Ross Brown, who was headmaster of Napier Boys at the time, noted that he, he drove from Napier Boys to the park and it took him 13 minutes. And he said, oh, drive to Hastings boys and see how long that takes me and guess what it took them 13 minutes so uh, proximity wise it was quite good to for both cities this is a historic photo one of the first assets that went in was the track followed by the grandstand and I've got this up here because um, you can't really see it from where you are but um, Barbara Arnott's in there Keith Price is in there from the region Keith Price sorry Keith uh, you're not in the photo I mean Alan Dick is in there um, and so was uh, Lawrence Yule and Rex Graham, who were proponents of it at the time. We did have quite a bit of stuff we had to get through. We had some time in the district court. Um, a group took us there challenging the granting of the consent to put in the athletics track. Um, it was quite a frustrating time because this was after the track had actually gone in, so no judge was going to tell us to rip it up. But nevertheless, it made our fundraising pretty hard. And we did spend time in the environment court too over 
building on fertile land. So um, it's one of those processes you need to kind of go through whenever you do anything of significance. And I, I know you're aware of that, but we certainly went through quite a few hoops. Nevertheless, in 2010, um, Bill English opened the track and the grandstand, and it sort of went off really well straight away. <coughs> I was really nervous about this time. The, the we, he opened the grandstand, I think I'll say on the 6th of December or something like that, and we had this event, the New Zealand Athletics Champs, a few days later, but actually we got through fine. We didn't have any particular teething problems, and uh, Jack O'Gill, you see there, he's um, just been to Tokyo Olympics, so he, he was um, on the up then, and and through several world youth records at that meet, so that was fun. And we've had some quite quite significant things since. This is Nick Willis running here in the middle of the pack. Uh, in March next year, we'll have the New Zealand Athletics Champs there again. We had them there this year. So um, they're great things. They um, bring a fair bit of interest and money and that sort of thing in, into the community, so we enjoy having them. But as far as we're concerned, actually, they come at quite a cost, usually although we charge a sort of a venue hire, what we charge is far, far outweighed by the cost to us of putting it on. Again, it's probably not a surprise to you. Uh, this is the biggest thing we've done, and this really stretched us. So we had uh, Tamata Tini there, Kapahaka Festival in 2017. It was great, I loved it, but I was sort of very nervous throughout it too because we were coping with volumes of people that wasn't really designed to cope for, but it did work and, and it went off really well. So we, we feel... Um, uh, really pleased to have hosted something of that scale. Uh, this one here, might, this slide might be a bit of interest to you. Um, I mentioned before when we have big events, we we love having them, but they usually come at a bit of a cost to us. This is um, this was taken a while ago where we had the Colgate Games, um, which is sort of junior athletics champs, and the New Zealand Secondary School Athletics Champs in, in close succession. One was December, one was January. Um, often when I have something of that scale, we'll do a survey of the people who come, so we'll go around and ask a couple of hundred people a standard set of questions. Uh, the interesting thing for me in this one was that the, um, the spend for those two events in the region was about $1.8 million or about 1.3 addition to GDP. So, you know, we think that's a pretty good thing that facilities like this can attract. And um, it's one where we feel that we're kind of doing our bit for the community, if you like, because as I say, they usually cost us quite a bit more to put on than, than in fact what they deliver to us. Mm. But they do deliver a lot more to the community, both um, economically speaking, and also um, often say, you know, we need heroes to incentivize the younger kids, and we do get a lot of heroes at these events. Um, an aspect that we really like about it, and I think in Hawke's Bay we, we underrate ourselves across the board, but if you look at that um, second to bottom one there, that's we said to people, look, on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you think of the venue? And I'm not kidding, half of them give it a 10 out of 10. And um, three quarters of these people will remember are out-of-towners. So if you're an Aucklander or you're from Wellington and you're sitting in a grandstand and it's probably a lovely, well, it was a lovely day, and they're looking out over Tomato Peak as a backdrop. They can park about 100 metres away, so it's close. Um, the facilities, the loos and all that sort of stuff, that pragmatic stuff is is good and so we do get great scores for it um, and I think within Hawke's Bay we, we underrate what we have here as far as that's concerned and it's really only when you get a lot of out-of-towners who come and experience it and give us their feedback that you realise actually we've got something pretty good. Importantly though um, from my perspective it's, uh, it's the community use of these facilities that make them hum or not and um, we love having the big events and all that sort of thing but this is what makes it work and so these are the days I really enjoy this is Karamu High School having its athletic sports here so there's 600 kids yelling yelling their heads off for their houses and that sort of thing so they're great days and, and that's the sort of thing that makes it work for us uh, the other main the sort of next main asset we had had on board when we started was netball and um, I put this up it's an old old clip but um, one of the really important things to us as far as our ongoing viability has been the support of our sponsors <coughs> and you know often just good Hawke's Bay citizens so in this case it was the Smith family that um, owns and runs Hastings Pack and Save so they've helped us a heck of a lot with netball for over 10 years now we also you know we're really lucky with the loyalty of our sponsors but um, they're the sort of people 
that enable us to provide a facility that costs a whole lot less to users than it would if they were not involved. So, for example, what we receive from those guys is much, much more than we receive from the entire netball fraternity. So can't underestimate the amount of the subsidy they're giving us. Actually, in thinking about it, I probably should have changed the headline on this one. But um, when I say New, New Zealand, we're proud of the hockey, hockey facility we've got there. When I say New Zealand's premier venue, at the time it was the only FIH accredited one. In other words, you can host internationals there. Um, but it, so we, you know, we liked having that hockey tournament and that sort of thing. But again, it's whether it's successful or not is determined by the extent to which the community uses it. Got <coughs> eight sports fields there, so that's uh, football, touch, and league are the main tenants that use that. <coughs> this next one here, the Canoe Polo Centre. I don't know if, if many of you seen that. <coughs> okay, so uh, I really love that, and the reason I love it is because uh, the Canoe Polo club has taught me quite a bit um, they're a sport that was desperate to have a venue because they didn't have one so you know they, they trained in pools which aren't the correct size or just anywhere they could really um, so they worked really really hard to make this facility happen and by that I mean they they the club itself which is about <coughs> 700 members raised $150,000 themselves uh, they tipped in about $50,000 worth of man hours and now they really own, in inverted commas, the facility. So they're fantastic tenants for, as far as we're concerned. I kind of give me no grief. If something goes wrong, they just sort it themselves. And um, so they've taught me quite a lesson as far as uh, how it should work when you're developing new facilities. So if, if the club or the entity involved has got skin in the game, they're going to be a lot more supportive of it and a lot more respectful of it than if it's handed to them on a plate. And these guys are a great example of that. Um, one thing you might not appreciate or understand that well is there are two trusts that operate out of the park. <clears throat> so I'm representing the Hawke's Bay Regional Sports Park Trust. Uh, it's a 30 hectare site. We control the assets on about 28 of those hect hectares. Um, the two hectares in the middle, um, that's the Community Fitness Centre Trust, so that's the Graham Avery Trust. And actually Graham's done some fantastic work in putting money together, so that's why we've got the sports hall here, that's one of their main assets, and that was um, opened about a year ago. Uh, in terms of what we've got on the go, this is the next cab off the rank, in fact the sort of sod turning for that will probably occur in about two weeks. It's an indoor training centre for Central Districts Cricket, is one arm of that L, the long arm. Uh, the other arm of that L is a centre for Giants Boxing. Uh, they're not not a big entity, but they do lots of great kids for kids, lots of great stuff for kids that are in a, in a bit of bother. As part of the uh, cricket facility, there, there's also an outdoor wicket going. Sorry, a covered outdoor wicket going in there. So it's uh, I think it's 18 wickets, and it's it's kind of like a greenhouse over the top of it. Um, the good thing about that, I mentioned having skin in the game. The um, that the cricket facility. Um, the one I referred to earlier, this one here, uh, that is about a, a $2 million build and um, a bit over 90% of that is coming from non-ratepayer sources. So the, the, the model's working quite well, you know, with, with the trust set up we're able to pull in a bit, bit more sponsorship money than the council might be able to do. and. Do a few other things, so we think that's a you know that's an example of a fantastic ratepayer deal where they're they're getting uh, an asset of two million dollars, and the ratepayers themselves have, have only needed to tip in about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Having said that, it was supposed to be a one and a half million dollar build, and it's um it's now two. So I've got these very the part that I don't like like about my job is I have to put money together all the time, and we're, you know costs are blowing out quite a lot. So there's another half million dollars we have to find, and I'm not asking you for money. Don't worry. If you had some, I'd chuck it this way. But but, but um. Uh, so, you know, between now and, and March next year, I've got to find another half million dollars to make that work. So it's, um, uh, it's an example of us working really, really hard, and as a consequence of that, the ratepayers end up with, with a pretty good deal at the end of it. This is the outdoor pool. So um, that's, again, this is um, one of Graham's gigs, and it's uh, due for completion, as indeed is all the development we've got on the go about this time next year. Uh, and alongside that, and the sort of last thing we have on the go development-wise is this. So it's a 60-bed accommodation hostel, and again, um, so that's designed to house people who 
have stuff happening at the park and again it's probably uh, Napier's experience as well but we do find uh, Hawke's Bay is a venue that people love coming to for training camps because we've got a lot of really good recreation we've got great facilities and we have great weather so um, as an example we the New Zealand athletics squad would be here probably four times a year and um, that's driven by the facilities we have and the other things that Hawke's Bay has to offer. Um, so just by way of operational um, summary, uh, we do feel the model is great. It's um, ratepayers get a hev heavily subsidised output as a consequence. I, I mentioned that example before with respect to the cricket building, and that's that's not unique. That is the, the way things are going. Um, as far as outdoor facilities are concerned, um, the stuff that falls under our trust umbrella is primarily an outdoor facility. Um, as a rough rule of thumb, I think if it's a with council run outdoor facilities, the council n normally ends up picking up about 90% of the tab. Uh, in our case, the council picks up about 35% of the tab. So we get more from our sponsors and other supporters than we do from the council. So you can't underestimate it both in terms of the subsidy that it gives the ratepayers and in terms of our sheer ability to be able to build stuff. I mean, all the things that we've got on the go, I mean, if I came to you or came to Hastings and said, can I have money to build all this stuff? I mean, it wouldn't happen. So we, we are finding ways to find a heck of a lot more money than, than might come by conventional sources. Excuse me, Jock, I was remiss at the beginning not to tell you that um, the time limit is usually 10 minutes for the public forum, but there's some flexibility in that. So um, we have exceeded the 10 minutes, but I'm quite happy for you to continue. Um, there may not be a lot of time for questions at the end. I, okay, look, thanks, Maxine. I've just a couple more to go. I'll um, this is just an indication, one of the key measures for us is user numbers. Um, there's about 400,000 go through us per annum at the moment normally, COVID notwithstanding. We think that might be up around a million when all the um, new facilities come on stream or a few years down the track from that. And what you see there is just some examples of how sports have grown since being located there. Um, I mentioned before there's two trusts. So t two trusts operate the place, us and the Community Fitness Centre Trust. Um, so where to from here, the, um, we're in the midst of a long-term planning ex exercise and actually Glenn from Napier City is giving us a hand on that, Glenn Lucas. So um, we're saying, given where Sport and Rec is headed generally, what are the things that we should be planning for both in, in an operational sense and a, in a facility sense? So that, that necessarily includes the sorts of things that NCC has on the radar, so that's why um, uh, Glenn's input is important to that process and so we're saying taking all that into account what are the sort of things that we should have our ra on our radar screen over the next 10 years or so both in terms of the facilities that we plan for and how they're operated. So finally last slide I mean as we are pretty proud of where we're at at the moment um, the model is pr working pretty well both in a sort of financial sustainability sense and also as far as our ability to build and have viable new facilities including those ones that we've got on the go. So look, thank you very much for listening and um, if there is any time for questions I'm very happy to field them. Yes, are there any questions councillors? Well if there are none, um, thank you very much Jock, that was a very um, comprehensive presentation and it's great to see all the good things that are happening at the park. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks Max. Right, the next item on our agenda, are there any announcements by the Mayor? No, sorry. <laughs> announcements by the Chairperson? No. Um, notification of minor matters not on the agenda? Anybody? No. There are some announcements by management. Um, I'd like to ask um, Antoinette Campbell, Director of Community Services, has an announcement to make. Oh, and then, oh, okay, sorry, Lance Titter, um, Director um, City Services, you have a present, something to Just tell us. an update on the, we met last night for the notices um, at all, uh, the duty footing on the call day, we've got no issues, our millisecond at the present time is pumping 760 litres a second, at this time we'd be burning 350 to 400, so we've got no issues here, 
Um, I've spoken to Dave Paku from the Regional Council this morning. They've got no issues and we're working together. We will update you if it changes. If this weather stays as it is, I cannot see any issues for us. Thank you. Brilliant. Great news. Well done. Thank you very much, Lance. Um, Antoinette Campbell, you have some announcements. Uh, kia ora, councillors. Um, just wanted to provide you a bit of an update on the 2021 Social Monitor survey, um, which will be presented um, formally to council in the, um, in the new year at the next People in Places Committee meeting. Um, so the 2021 Social Monitor survey was conducted mid-August to late September with a total of 610 respondents. Um, overall perceptions of safety have increased since the March 2021 Community Safety Survey. 56% um, percent feel safe, which is up from 45%. Um, however, the Social Monitor um, Survey of 2020 was 73%. Um, there have been significant improvements since March um, 2021 um, in terms of feeling safe walking alone um, in neighbourhoods after dark um, and also feeling safe going out at night in Napier. Um, however, 51% of residents report feeling less safe compared to 12 months ago. Um, so the monitor, this um, particular survey was conducted mid-August to late September using the usual channels with an emphasis on a more representative sample of Māori, um, which was achieved. Um, as I said, the full report will be presented um, at the next People and Places Committee meeting in February. Um, but in the meantime, we will continue to work with police and community stakeholders in the three target areas to address the lowered perceptions of safety and um, issues of visible antisocial behaviour. So these three areas are Mirewa, Weshaw and the CBD. Um, and just FYI, the City Ambassador and CCTV project is progressing towards implementation um, from 1 July next year. Thanks. Thank you, Antoinette. That's very reassuring. So moving on, um, confirmation of minutes. Would somebody like to move that the minutes of the Napier People and Places Committee meeting held on Thursday the 23rd of September 2021 be taken as a true and accurate record of the meeting? Councillor Mawson, seconded Councillor Crystal. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. Right, thank you, carried. Um, first agenda item is the Community Grants and Funding Review. And we have Matt Adamson, Senior Advisor Policy, and um, Natasha Carswell, City Strategies, to speak. Oh, sorry, Natasha Mackey, City Strategies um, Manager. Thank you. Um, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Kia ora, Madam Chair, Your Worship, and Councillors, and the other members at Dias. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to introduce the review into community grants and funding. Um, our grants and funding program is a significant part of Council's support for Napier's community sector. The shape of this program has been through an evolutionary process over the years, but an opportunity exists for Council to be more intentional and proactive with the direction of the grants program. There is the opportunity for Council's grants program to become a more strategic investment into the success of our community sector. Council directly provides seven core funds which now distribute over $1 million per annum combined and at the request of the Chair I'll take a quick moment to run through these um, but I do note that we will soon be in a position to share with you a detailed report on grants and funding activity over the last three years. So the largest portion of our community funding comes through the service agreements that we have entered into with 11 community organisations and these organisations provide services that are of a broader benefit to Napier residents. At the moment, these have a combined value of $628,000. The Community Service Fund is an annual contestable grant that awards smaller grants for project or service delivery costs. It also funds a rate subsidy to non-profit groups who own a commercially rated building, and this fund is worth $115,000. Community development grants are open year-round and support smaller community-led projects. Uh, in previous years, events such as the Waitangi Day celebrations have been supported through this fund and it currently has $100,000 allocated to it in this financial year. Council projects grants support larger proposals, typically over $30,000 and there is $100,000 available in this fund. Um, our Youth Council also provides an annual funding opportunity for local rangatahi to receive financial assistance to pursue their dreams. 
and this fund is now worth $7,000. There is a $50,000 allocation to aid implementation of the arts and culture policy and support the development of public art in Napier. And lastly, there are two small bequests administered by the community strategies team, which provide a modest return depending on interest rates. We also uh, administer the Creative Communities Fund on behalf of Creative New Zealand, and that has two funding rounds per year. So that's a bit, that's a bit of an overview of what we do in the grant space. Uh, and we have identified the opportunity for a real review of the whole program, which we haven't really done for, for a while. Uh, the aim of this review is to both uh, improve our funding process, processes, but also to maximise the impact of Council's investment in this area. Uh, and all of the seven core funds previously mentioned are in the scope of this review. Uh, so an internal group of staff and councillors has been established to provide strategic guidance for this review. And thank you, Madam Chair and Councillor Wright, for agreeing to be a part of this group and for your help in developing the framework that is attached to this paper. We're looking to engage with the wider group of councillors at key points and we'll, begin look, and we'll be looking to begin this when we're in a position to start testing ideas. A high-level timeline for the review is included in the report. Uh, I can confirm that the desktop analysis is already well underway and initial discussions with groups who have prior experiences with our program uh, is on track to commence later this month. The team have also written to current service agreements to alert them of the review and we plan to communicate with um, all our interested parties as we progress to this review. So over to you for any questions. Any questions, anybody? Yes, Councillor McGrath. So if, if councillors, other councillors wanted to um, put up some ideas, what's, what's our best bet to be able to do that? Approach um, the people on there or, or approach you guys first? Um, I would suggest you approach Councillor Bogan, Councillor Wright, if you have any ideas. But happy to talk to you if you'd like. Right, I've got, just got a couple. I'll, I'll share with them at some stage. Mm. And we, will, we are looking to have a workshop with you at some stage around the ideas around that. Cool. Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Uh, thank you for the paper. Um, I had a couple of things that I just wanted um, some clarification to make sure they were covered off. One of them um, is, of course, because we're capturing the council's project fund, um, the initial, I suppose, reason for that fund was to be adaptive and responsive. And I note there's a section in um, the framework that speaks to that. But it's not specific, I suppose, to time frames you, um, in terms of ad hoc things that come through to council that need funding and I just wanted some certainty that that would be covered off um, in the assessment. I, the, it's kind of danced around I think a little bit in terms of flexibility and that we reflect industry best practice and some mm. thoughts on that. Um, through the chair, um, yep, we fully acknowledge the, um, the creation of the council projects fund and, and how that arose in terms of um, being able to fund larger projects and not necessarily only community organisations to access that, that funding. So all of the parameters of each of the funds um, will be tested against the criteria and recommendations made. Um, and so certainly the um, <coughs> ad hoc nature of a number of the funds actually uh, is an ad you know, causes advantages and disadvantages overall. So all of those um, aspects would be tested through the review. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, just a, a second question I have. Um, the other, I suppose, side of things, um, and I've just lost my train of thought. Bear with me. Maybe I've go got another. Actually, yeah. anybody else? Any questions? Because I have one. Um, just in terms of the funding that we now allocate, it's all allocated within the financial year. So I assume if there are any changes, it won't be for this financial year, it would be for the following financial year? Yeah, that's correct. We'd look to start um, any sort of implementation um, in the next financial year, or depending on the long-term plan, depending on how the, the impact falls. Thank you. Yes, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. The thought has returned to me. Um, the other side of things, um, and it's my experience that often our community organisations, especially in those service agreement um, ones, which I know to wrapped up in this, is that concept that we're not funding enough, so the quantity of the funding. Um, that doesn't seem to be reflected in the framework as such as well, and I just wonder if you could touch on that. Um, yeah, so it's not directly addressed in the framework, but I'd argue that when we look at community need, that kind of thing will come through. Um, so that would certainly be part of the conversation. Okay, thank you. Just following on from that, um, 
Will there be an opportunity for this? You've given us the figures, the current figures that are allocated to each of those grants. Is there an opportunity for council to um, raise or lower or change those allocations within this discussion? Uh, certainly through the annual plan or the long-term plan process, that would be the, the, the forum to do that. Right, thank you. Um, just adding to, adding to that, obviously um, with the findings of the review, there may be a um, recommendation around um, establishing new a new fund or disestablishing funds, increasing allocations, decreasing allocations. So all of that should be covered um, with recommendations uh, for the council. Thank you, mm. Councillor Tarpene. Um, thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I've got two questions. Um, the first one is around um, the supporting structures for the various grants. So. I know a lot of thought is put into criteria, who can apply, how you apply and the processes. Um, in the last term, I recall having conversations with some of the opportunities uh, that we might be able to consider in bolstering the administrative and operational side of these grants. And I was particularly thinking of how we advertise, how we reach market, how diversity and innovation in those spaces can help draw in more applications for those grants. So I remember there being quite a narrow field or scope uh, or ability of our staff to be able to reach some markets because of that. Will that be a part of the assessment going forward? Uh, yes, certainly it would be part of the assessment going forward and I can imagine there would be some suggestions around how we best market our grants <coughs> but also how we make them more accessible. So for example, moving to a fully online application system or something that could be considered through this. So to answer your question, yes. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And I think um, Natasha's already answered the question. Um, based on what findings you'll come, there'll be some new uh, potentially, there could be some new grants or new categories. Um, is it within the scope or thinking of our team to also include such things as waste minimisation, parekore, climate change, those types of things? Whether that's a cope up for the grant or to expand the opportunity for groups to apply in those areas? Uh, through the Chair, um, absolutely. I think um, one of the things that we want to look at is it, and it's, it's not necessarily directly in the scope, but there are other funds too that council administers. And if we can establish streamlined processes, um, other funds may actually be able to be administered through that process as well. So certainly um, we will be acknowledging that and looking at particularly what the funds are responding to and how they can in the future be more responsive to the changing needs of the community. Awesome. And my final question, Madam Chair, is one of the other items I recall from um, various committees was how we structure the participants on the committee itself, how we remunerate and provide for their resourcing and ability to participate. Is that also part and parcel of the scope? Yep, that's in scope too. So we'll be looking at whether we've got the balance right around the decision making process and that will look at um, the committee structure and whether that is the correct way to go forward. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions, councillors? Um, yes, Chief Executive. So a comment was made previously about all of the grants being allocated for this financial year. So just to correct the record, um, the council projects fund is not yet allocated. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And sorry, just to clarify on that, the figures I was referring to were the budget allocations in that financial year, not what's been oh, okay. given out. Thank you. Okay, well the officer's recommendation is basically receiving this report. Um, so the recommendation, I'd like a mover and a seconder please for that the Napier People and Places Committee A, note the framework and criteria to be used in the review. B, note that councillors Bogue and Wright are part of the review working group. And C, note that a range of community stakeholders will be engaged during this review. Is there a mover and a seconder please? Councillor Wright, seconded by Councillor Crystal. Would you like to speak to it? Any discussion? No, I need to say that um, this review is very timely. Some of our policies are 
are quite outdated, particularly the arts one, which I know we've been looking to review for some time, so it's great that this is all getting packaged together and that we get an, an opportunity now to look at everything across the board. And, and just a note to say that having been involved with some of these organisations and having accessed funding um, through these various grants for capability and sustainability reviews for those organisations and how that sort of targeted approach to supporting organisations to become um, more sustainable in their approach to their, their business um, has proved quite valuable and that's one of the things that we can um, we can start looking at emphasising in some of the um, criteria and, and the outcomes that we want to see as a council because everything we should do should be supporting these organisations to, su to survive not just on our funding but to move towards being able to operate and, and maintain their growth and sustainability themselves. So I really support this process and I hope that we'll get some really cool um, policies moving forward that will make things better for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Crystal? Um, I'm just to say that I'm followed with interest being on a couple of the grants committees. It's been really interesting to read this and, and follow what's happening. So, Right. Anybody else like to comment? Thank okay. You. Oh, sorry. Councillor Tarpani. Um, so just to concur and support the comments made by my colleagues, but also to express um, an extension of Councillor Wright's for Cardo. <clears throat> Since these policies were developed originally, um, we only had three pillars of which to be aware of. The fourth pillar of community wellbeing is now an integ integrated part of local authorities. And so I'm really excited to see this opportunity come forward because it gives us the chance to, first of all, recognize how uh, these grants have been contributing to the diversity and vibrancy of our city, but also to undertake a in-depth study to um, or assessment to recognise where we can use these grants and um, the resources of council to further expand on the wellbeing of our city and to drive that interconnectedness uh, between the various groups and our residents who participate in these events. So um, this is an exciting uh, and key piece of work which could really have an impact on uh, safety, connectedness and vibrancy within our city. So kia kaha. Right, I'm going to put the recommendation. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against say no. The recommendation is carried. Thank you very much. So I'd like to move on to item two, Safer Napier's reaccreditation application. Um, Michelle Griggs, Senior Advisory Policy, and um, Natasha Mackey, City Strategies Manager. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Michelle Gregg tōku um, Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak to this paper this morning. Um, essentially, the paper asks you to note the information that we've submitted as part of the Safer Napier reaccreditation application, which was put in on the 1st of October this year. And the paper also notes that the outcome of our application will be determined on the 1st of December when the reaccreditation assessment team visits Napier. Um, we brought the annual Safer Napier summary paper to you in April and referred to the Safer Napier strategic group's intention to seek reaccreditation. And we were really pleased to have this supported by many of our signatory partners who attended our annual planning workshop in May this year. Um, Napier was first accredited as a safe community, as you all know, in 2010 and was then re-accredited in 2016. Uh, we're, required, we're required to be re-accredited every five to seven years um, and to be recognised internationally um, under the model of safe communities and this is also recognised by the World Health Organisation. Uh, the reaccreditation process really reflects the collaborative approach of the program. The application itself was led by a working group of members from our strategic group and involved a wide range of agencies and organisations as well as community groups who share the common goal of improving safety in our community in all of its forms. So just to clarify there, that includes not only crime prevention but also injury prevention emergency preparedness, addiction-related harm, and community connectedness. 
So as part of our application, we were required to provide evidence against a number of performance measures about what we've been doing over the last five years or so. And this evidence was supported by a covering document which we've included as an attachment to your paper. Um, this highlights you know, what we've been doing since the last reaccreditation and also where we see ourselves going into the future. So the application is currently being reviewed by <coughs> excuse me, a team of six accredited assessors and one of whom is based in Australia, so that they're our international assessor. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to report to you is that we're really pleased to have over 60 entities um, commit to the kaupapa of Safe and Napier by agreeing to sign a memorandum of commitment. And uh, this is essentially a mutual agreement to work together for the benefit of the community across a, the whole range of safety issues. Um, and we'll be celebrating this, this memorandum, of memorandum of commitment at a signing ceremony on the 1st of December. That's also when the National Assessor, Assessor Team will be visiting to ask questions about our application. And this will be followed by the reaccreditation ceremony itself, which is being hosted by our Ambassador, Mayor Wise. So as a collective, we're really looking forward to the next period following reaccreditation, assuming that goes through. We're pretty sure it will be um, the case. Um, the Safe Communities Foundation of New Zealand is ceasing to operate later this year. And this has given the 20 accredited communities around the motto uh, an opportunity to work together to develop a national network, which is actually led, coordinated and managed by the collective. Um, to ensure some sustainability and that continued connection going forward. So we're really excited about that opportunity and what it brings to all of the safe communities around the country. So just before I take questions, we're going to show a short video um, which was part of our application and it really captures what Safe and Napier is all about. Um, and you'll no doubt recognise quite a few familiar faces in this. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou katoa, i rauika mai, i ronga i tēnei kaupapa, a tāhua, ki a koutou nā rūpū mahi, kua nā kou titikaha, ki te haumaratanga o aharere. Taku arohanui, ki a koutou katoa, mai i tāko nā kou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Greetings everyone that have come together to support this beautiful project. To all involved organisations, those of you who have stayed committed to our Safer Napier, for our family and all communities, from my heart to you all, thank you very much. Safe and Napier is a collaboration of over 40 agencies, community groups and organisations that work together here in Napier to improve community safety. We look at injury prevention, crime prevention, community resilience, um, addiction related harm and road safety. So our partners who are very wide and diverse um, reflect that. We have big large organisations down to our wonderful community groups. What I've found interesting in being involved with Safer Napier is the help that we can give to the community. My job is to get, out, get amongst the community and raise awareness around gambling harm. Age Concern is a not-for-profit organisation that services the needs of older people within the community. Neighbourhood support is about connecting people to build a safer, more resilient community, developing a caring and secure environment particularly for the elderly or isolated. It's really important for our organisation to ensure that people that live, work and play in Napier CBD are safe. The benefits of having community connections across the Safer Napier uh, network and through civil defence is that we catch uh, everyone, that there is nobody that falls through the gaps, that we have that safety net that picks people up. It's like a win-win. It helps Tarangi High to achieve our particular goal to reduce harm in our community. We're unable to get those uh, hard to reach communities and instead of us just sending one message, we can go as a joint group. And so for Napier plays a really critical role in ensuring that our organisations work closely with our community collectively. 
what exercise we've been able to achieve for Fano is uh, Faka Fanunga Tanga, so bringing Fano together. The byproduct is the uh, physical well being, but also the mental well being. The Youth Council is a part of Safer Napier, so our voices can be heard. It's great to know that Safer Napier is prioritising road safety. Thanks to the new road changes here at Napier Girls High, I can skate through school safely in one piece. Some of the ways that we determine what the priorities are is by talking with our community, um, both with the coalition, the 40 agencies or so, coming together to tell us about what their issues are around safety in Napier. Safe and Napier for us provides us that forum to hear the voice of the stakeholders in the community across age groups, across settings, across their areas of expertise and work together with our partners to actually construct potential opportunities, solutions and share that messaging back into the community. The importance of working in partnership with people and groups enhances our relationship with our local community. It was really nice to have our voices heard and be acknowledged because as students we walk these roads every day. Over the last 12 months the Hawke's Bay Police, including myself, have worked closely with the Safe and Napier group. We acknowledge there is a number of social harm issues in our communities and without our stakeholders involved, police will not be able to solve this on their own. I am pleased we are seeking reaccreditation for the second time as safety in all its forms is an important issue for our community. Reaccreditation is really important for the programme. It allows a mandate and a structure for organisations to come together under the Safe and Napier umbrella to work together on achieving and increasing safety in Napier. We are really looking forward to the next five years and working with our partners. We couldn't do this without them. Safe and Napier isn't just one organisation, it's the work of many. If we're all chipping away at Safer Napier in our own ways, we can achieve a lot more together. Kia haumaru te hapuri, kia orai te tangata. A safe community and our people are uplifted. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Oh, very nice. Um, are there any questions? Yes, Councillor Taylor. Ora, um, I'm just interested with the Safe Communities Foundation ceasing to exist and you're looking to set up this network, who will be responsible for accreditation in the future? Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, that's a great question. We're all members of the Pan Pacific Safe Communities Network, which includes safe communities in New Zealand, Australia and the United States. So that network establishes the framework for the reaccreditation and accreditation model, and that would continue. Yeah. So it's not dependent on Safe Communities Foundation? No, the foundation essentially is a network um, that brings together the communities across the country. So we're looking at having that as a community, safe community-led network rather than a standalone network, if that makes sense. Thank you. Councillor Simpson. Yeah, through you, Madam Chair. Um, great work. Um, it's a really good to see that this collaboration is happening. My question is similar to Councillor Taylor around the National uh, Foundation uh, disappearing. Will the local groups that are going to work collaboratively, are they going to form a charter so there's clear consistency around what you're aiming to achieve? Uh, through the Chair, so um, currently Michelle and I are on a um, smaller working group of those 20 um, accredited communities and we want to investigate the, the, the options in terms of what those frameworks could be. So we're about to go out as a, as a group to uh, a, get a consultant basically to assist us in looking at what potential options for a community-led network could look like. Um, so that will come back through to Council once we've got a, a clear idea. Right, thank you. Are there any other questions, councillors? Yes, Councillor McGrath. Just um, off on a little side note here, there's, there's a comment here that we're um, in, the, in the throes of uh, developing a child and youth wellbeing strategy. Could you just give us a really brief update on, on, on where we're at, where we're, where we're basically heading with that? Yes, I can, through the Chair. Um, so we're really pleased um, that we've made quite a lot of progress um, since we last talked about the strategy development and have started working with the Napier Pilot City Trust 
and we're about to uh, kick off with a workshop on the 20th of November, which is International Children's Day, uh, which will look at the engaging with the community um, around what they would like to see in such a strategy. And we see it as the very beginning of the consultation process in order to develop that strategy. And um, we're really looking forward to an ongoing partnership with Napier City Pilot Trust in the development of the strategy. And they've, they've provided that commitment to us that they'll be part of that too. And I must acknowledge their advocacy for the strategy over the, a number of years. And we're really pleased to um, be na now able to work on that with them. Thank you. And to you, Councillor McGrath, <laughs> of course. Very <laughs> Um, I just wanted to also suggest that the multicultural strategy be added as another strategy which we do have some commitment to um, putting together. Yes, in response to that. So um, that's uh, not current in our current work program, but it is coming up in the next year. Right. So that's why it's probably not quite there yet. Um, before we um, go to the recommendation, I just wanted to put a question out to the councillors. Um, this is quite a significant um, group, the Safe and Napier Strategies Group. I see it as um, led by the Napier City Council and its agencies, um, you know, quite a lot of agencies, um, and the Mayor is the ambassador for it. But um, I see um, my suggestion is I, I wonder for some feedback on our possibly um, having a councillor or two councillors on this group. They are the lead group for our Napier Disability Strategy, the Napier Youth Strategy, the Joint Alcohol Strategy, etc. And it might, I just felt it might bring us a bit closer um, as representatives of the community to this group um, and also be able to report back to council um, on what they're doing. I do see it as um, a governance um, group and I think that it would strengthen our connection with the group and input from the community if we had um, one or two councillors on it. And I just wondered if um, councillors, and I've sprung this on you, but if you've got any thoughts about it just as a recommendation, it just would need to go away and be discussed. But is there any feedback on that suggestion? Councillor Mawson. If there, uh, other, uh, my other colleagues have a desire to do so, I'm quite happy to put my name forward for that. Councillor yeah. McGrath. Uh, I'm currently a representative, representative on the Pilot City Trust, so I'm sure I'll be in the middle of it all as well. I'm just talking about the actual um, governance group, which is, you know, the police, ACC, DHB, etc. Any other comments or? Through the chair, just yep. to seek some clarification from council officers. So that governance group, how frequently do they meet? Uh, around about every six weeks uh, and they uh, just for some um, history I guess um, to, to put some context around it the uh, a, a number of years ago there was a safer communities um, committee of council uh, this was not this group that we're talking about um, but and and what happened that was disestablished in favor of a community services committee at the time which has now morphed into this committee. Um, so it's not a committee of council, this particular strategic group, um, and, but there are some communities that do have councillor representation on their strategic group, so it's not a, an, an impossible thing. Um, the group is currently made up of officers of all of those organisations, to, just to, and it is a very, um, very much a working group. So that it, it, while it, it is a governance for the program, it is the 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 way that it works is very operational. Um, so the group dynamic may need to change, and the terms of references may need to be revisited. Um, but I think it is a, a discussion that you might like to have. And I think there's the we recognised that we needed to have some governance input into the group, which is why the safer Napier ambassador position was created um, for the mayor. Um, but, you know, obviously there's, we can develop the program as, uh, with your guidance. Well, thank you, Councillor Mawson, um, for your <coughs> offer of participation. I think perhaps we need to have a look at portfolios, which portfolio this might um, best fit if 
the decision is made to involve a counsellor. But um, could we just go away and think about it um, and perhaps get some feedback from the officers about the practicality um, of this? I'm not trying to make a whole lot of extra work for anybody, but it just seems to me it is an important group that we could perhaps strengthen by having a closer connection with you know, the political arm, the governors of um, the Napier City Council. So are there any other comments or questions? Councillor Mawson. Yeah, just, just thanking the staff for all their commitment on this. Um, obviously, looking at the membership in 2010, the, the Safer Nap Napier Strategic Group has grown quite considerably, and that just shows um, all our stakeholders and, and the commitment they have for focusing on a Safer Napier. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. Well, thank you very much, and all the best for reaccreditation. I think um, that was a very good presentation, and I really appreciate the work that's been done to put it all together. So, um, would somebody like to move the officer's recommendation, which is the Napier People and Places Committee A note the safer Napier reaccreditation application, which was submitted on the first of October, twenty twenty one and B, note the outcome of the Safer Napier reaccreditation application will be confirmed on the 1st of December 2021. Mover and a seconder, uh, Mayor Wise moving, seconder Councillor Simpson. Is there any discussion? Would you like to speak to it? I'll oh, just to say that as the ambassador of um, Napier Safer, um, obviously, Safer Napier, sorry, very um, happy to move the recommendation before us today and say thank you to everyone who has been involved in the reaccreditation application process. Um, community safety is one of our key areas of focus, so it's great that we have a group such as this with the involvement of so many partner agencies throughout our community, so very happy to move the recommendation. Right. Anybody else would like to speak to it? Just to, just to add to what Mayor Wise has said um, through Madam Chair is I think it's collaborations like this that make our community stronger and I think it's really important that they have our, our endorsement and support so I think reaccreditation is a significant step. Great. Okay, if there's no further discussion, um, we're moving the officer's recommendation. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. The recommendation is carried. Thank you very much. Um, could I now please have someone to move that the public be excluded from the further proceedings of this meeting? Councillor Mawson, second to Deputy Mayor Brosnan, all those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. Thank you. Carried. <laughs>